it's great to be on the mountain of the Lord. Those of us on staff and faculty, we talk about the mountain. We know what each other are talking about. I'd like to ask uh, you to bow your heads as we begin. I'd like to uh, lead you in the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside still water. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anoints my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. That psalm was my grandfather's favorite psalm. And it has become my favorite psalm because it describes a God who is the leader of all leaders, who is the king of all kings, who cares about where you are in his pasture, but who is determined to lead you to greener pastures. God's very presence in our lives, to me, defines leadership. And exemplifies leadership. It tells us about his nature, you guys. God is a God of journey. Yes, he meets you here on the mountain where you are. But then he says to Abraham, go. And he says to Moses, lead my people. And he says to Mary, bear my son. God is a God who cares about your here. But I believe more and more the older I get that he's more concerned about your there. God is a God of great crossings, taking you from where you are today, leading you to where he wants you to be. He's a creator. He's a builder. He's a mover. He's a shaper. He's a strategizer. He's a transformer. And he's implementing the Holy Spirit in your life and in my life and in the world today to be and to become someone he wants us to be. He's a God of the future. He's not a God of just today. He's not a God of just good enough or ordinary or just as you are. He'll take you that way. But he's a God of journey and of great crossings. He wants to do something significant in your life. That is my message to you this morning from God, not from me. I believe with all of my heart because I've experienced it personally. He wants to do something significant in your life. And he's not going to make that significance just sending you somewhere. When he told Moses to go lead the people, he didn't send him. He went with him. He wants to be your personal deliverer. He's a God of great crossings and a great deliverer. Sometimes, and often I find, in Scripture, and also in my life, there are these moments of challenge. My good friend John Aiden, up sitting on the back row, defined them for me years ago as Red Sea moments. These times in your life, like Moses, when you come to an a position where you're faced with total uncertainty, you're overwhelmed with the odds being against you. And as I watched John this morning, with hands high and a heart abandoned, Moses has one thing to do, but to depend upon the Lord for his crossing. 
But it was his faith in God that allowed God to move and to make that crossing for all of his people. Sometimes it takes time. Oftentimes in the Bible, it's 40 days. 40 days and nights for Noah. 40 days on the mountain for Moses, teaching from God for 40 days. 40 days for David and 40 days of taunting by Goliath and nobody around him doing anything and he's ready to make the crossing with God. Israel, 40 years of wilderness wandering before they believed God in such a way that he delivered them to the new land. 40 days of testing for Jesus face to face with Satan having an encounter for 40 days and 40 nights ready to make his great crossing. And when he came back, he did 40 days of forced resurrection teaching to his disciples to get them ready. My prayer this week that he'll do something in seven days. Seven's a great number too. He created it all in seven days. I don't know where you are today coming to the mountain. I'll tell you where I am. My 91-year-old mother is in the hospital and has been in and out all year. She's literally struggling for her life. Jeannie's mother is in the hospital in rehab and recovery and has probably be there for another four weeks. We've had much sickness in our family and a lot of death of close friends. You may be here coming off a great Christmas, New Year season. Got the best presents you've ever gotten. Had great food, like Cole mentioned. You're doing awesome. And that's, that's a blessing. You also may be coming here from a kind of an estranged, tough situation with family or close friends. You may yourself this morning be in a relationship that's slipping, that's sliding, or maybe it's built on something that's not godly. You may have lost a job. You may have just gotten a job. You may have not done so well last semester. You know, these faculty back here could be pretty tough. You may have had a great semester. I don't know where you are. But I know that God wants you to make a great crossing. And he is going to meet us here and is meeting us here on this mountain. So we all have these Red Sea moments. And we know that God wants to make a great crossing and personally deliver us. And so there's just three things I want to share with you this morning that will keep you and keep me from making a great crossing. And I'll use the Israelites and some other examples to kind of wear that out. That's kind of where I started learning this. And uh, so number one, I think what will keep you and keep me, keep our nation, keep any church, keep any family, keep any marriage, any relationship from making a great crossing is we'll cling to the past. As soon as Israel was delivered and God was in the process of making this great crossing, they began to murmur, they began to complain, they began to look back toward Egypt. And you remember they even said, it was better in Egypt. What did they have in Egypt? Slavery, beatings, no food, no rest. And these people of God are saying, I want to go back. Because the, the future is uncertain for me. I can't see exactly what's there. But God shouts, look forward. Make a clean break. If you want to make a great Clark crossing with me. Listen to what he says in Isaiah 43, verse 16. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. God is a God of the future. Paul said it this way. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, heavenward in Christ Jesus. You know the past does inform you. Your baggage does inform you, but it does not control you. Do you believe that? We've all got baggage. I've got baggage. You've got baggage. And it does inform how we come to this mountain. But I'm telling you with everything that I've got, God 
is a God that controls the future. And he's calling you to be with him. He's calling us this week. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, 22. He's in the Sermon on the Mount. It's his first series of sermons. You got all these people like you that have come in. They don't know who he is. They just kind of want to check it out. You don't know what's going to happen at Summit. And Jesus says this to them in Matthew 6, 22. If your eyes are good, if they're healthy, some translations say, if you can see what I can see, if you see what God sees, if you see the future and you're not looking to the past, Jesus said, then your whole self, your whole body, your whole soul is full of light. Jesus is light. Great leaders are full of light. But he says it starts with your eyes. And he says, if your eyes are bad, you know, Paul said in Ephesians 1.18, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I want to see you. I want to see you on this mountain. He said, if your eyes are bad or if they're dark, great, he said, is the darkness within you. You're enveloped by that which is evil and dark and ordinary, not the Spirit of God. In Hebrews 12.1, Paul, or the writer, whoever that may be, tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus, longing for a better country. And he says, I will deliver you. Got ahead of myself. <laughs> hey, could you advance those slides a little bit? Okay, so number one, here's the lesson. Don't cling to the past. You see the polar bear? Grab the wrong, wrong piece of ice. Um, you wouldn't let it go. And God is saying to you from his word, as far as the east is, from the West, so have I removed your transgressions from you. Number two, let's, let's, uh, let, all right, let's show, let's, let's show this clip. Um, this is a famous clip that we show at Summit every year. It's from Les Mis, and it's about a six-minute clip uh, that uh, I think you'll come to appreciate, and we have. But remember, it's about not clinging to the past, but straining and struggling to an aspiration for God. So don't cling to your past. I love it when the, when the bishop says, I know who you are. That's God speaking to me. I know who you are. I know your past. But I've ransomed your soul to give you a future. Don't cling to the past if you want to make a great cross to God. Number two, the fear of failure will keep you from success. How many of you so many times have an opportunity to make a change in your life and it's the fear of failing before men that causes you to put the brakes on and not move forward with God. David and Goliath, all of the fighting men of Israel were there, taunting, getting this taunting from Goliath, and they would not do anything for they were afraid. He said, you come with spear and javelin, but I come in the name of the Lord. David had courage against this fear. Mark Twain said it this way, when you think about fear and about courage, courage is the resistance to fear, the mastery of fear. It is not the absence of fear. You hear what he's saying? We all are afraid. Courage and faith is the resistance to it and the mastery of it, faith versus fear. This example I use, I've used it for years. Uh, we have three daughters. We'll talk a little bit more about those this afternoon. All went through ACU. My oldest daughter, Kelly, uh, Tim Johnson and I were her basketball coach and his daughter's basketball coaches for years. There's stories about all that. But one of the things that has become a hallmark, unfortunately, that I get to tell story on is Kelly was a great defensive player. I could put her on the ball. We could put her on any player all the way up through high school. And Kelly, could, she could take the ball away. She could stop the offense. She could do all that. But on offense, every time they passed the ball to her, it was like a nanosecond and she passed it off. And this went on, and I'm trying to be a good dad, and I'm not be that parent on the sideline, you know, kind of thing. And one day, after a ball game, I, I just, I settled down, I just, I said, Kelly, honey, I don't understand. You're so talented. You're so athletic. You're so great on defense. I said, why won't you shoot the ball? And the classic line that describes my life so often, Dad, I was afraid if I'd shoot I'd miss. Oh, Father in heaven, I was afraid that if I tried this to make this crossing, that I'd miss, I'd fail. That's not the Spirit of God in any of us. 
God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. You remember Abraham, my favorite description of Abraham in faith, is that he said, he, though his body was as good as dead, he believed that God had the power to do what he said he could do. Take that away for point number two. That God has the power to do what he said he'd do. A couple of pictures, I think, uh, if you'd advance. <clears throat> This is a real picture uh, taken uh, when they were building Rockefeller Center. Talk about overcoming your fear. These guys, I don't know, they're 30 stories up, 40 stories up, no harnesses, no ropes. They're having a great time having lunch up there talking to each other next. These guys are bridge painters on the, on the, on the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, OSHA wouldn't go for this today. There's no harnesses, nothing going on. They're just hanging out painting. They were painters painting the bridge. The fear of failure, you guys, will keep you from success. And so often, it happens to us. In John chapter 9, there was a man that was born blind. Do you remember that story? And Jesus healed the man that was born blind. And this thing, the Pharisees were going back and forth. Who did this? Who was this guy? Did this really happen? Was he really blind? Is this really the guy? And what I remember so much out of that passage is they come to the blind man's parents and the Pharisees ask him, is this the Jesus that healed your son? And they said, well, we don't know who he is. We know that our son was born blind, but we don't know who this man is. And then there's this parenthetical quote from John that says, they knew that anyone who proclaimed that Jesus was the Christ would be tossed out of the synagogue, would be tossed out of their friend circle, would be tossed into a different ring. And they loved the praises of men so much that they couldn't even confess Jesus who healed their blind son. The fear of failure will just keep you from becoming who God wants you to be. And finally, number three, the voice of the crowd, social pressure, peer pressure, what other people think, just like the blind man's parents so often will define us and not allow us to make a great crossing with God. Let's take a look at this clip. I think you guys, particularly at your point in life, but also in mine, when we listen to the voice of the crowd, we disallow God to do something great in us. You know it. The voice of the crowd is a voice that drags you to the lowest common denominator. Satan's voice pulls you down. The voice of God and the Spirit of God cause you to dream great dreams, to follow his voice, to make a difference in the world, and he wants you to make this great crossing. Let me end on this one example from my own family, and then we'll say a prayer and be done. When our girls were little, we oftentimes uh, had a time of just quick scripture reading and, and prayer before they went to bed. And sometimes you're very tired when you try to do that and life gets busy. But this one particular night, we were all extremely exhausted. I, rem I just remember it so well. We gathered in Michelle's room, who's our youngest. And I would say to the girls always, uh, somebody's going to read the scripture. And then, um, if you would, would you interpret it? And of course, thinking now, that was not a good incentive because who's going to volunteer to read if you have to explain it? But I wasn't very smart back then as a dad. So we were all tired and nobody was volunteering and finally Hannah says, okay, dad, I'll do it. We were in Matthew seven thirteen, where Jesus said, basically, narrow is the way and few there be that find it. Do you remember that passage in his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew seven thirteen? Basically, guys, there's a way to life, but it's narrow. It's through me. And unfortunately, few people find it. And I said, well, that's a great reading, Hannah. I said, so um, anybody know what it means? Let's just open it to everybody. And there was dead silence. And I said, well, why don't we just have a prayer? We're tired tonight. She goes, Dad. Hannah goes, Dad, 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 Dad. No, 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 I know what it means. And I said, okay, great. Hannah, go. She's eight years old. Dad, I think it's like when we're in Colorado... You know, she said, when we want to go up to a big mountain and everybody gets on the same road and all the cars get on the same trail 
and there's dust and there's fumes and it's kind of crowded and we race to get to the top together. She said, but I've observed if you look out into the field, in the field, there's fresh flowers and there's lots of paths to the top, but they're not very well traveled because people follow everybody else to the top. But she said, Dad, the view is so much better on those trails. And I was like, the Holy Spirit dwell in me. I thought, that's awesome. I said, let's pray. She goes, no, 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 no. I got another example. I said, bring it. Just bring it. She said, it's also like, I don't know what's happening. It's also like in Colorado, she said, when we go by the rivers and the valleys. And I said, yeah. And she said, yeah. She said, everybody stops by those bridges or by the certain fishing holes. Everybody stops, and they all are throwing their lines in, and people are crowded around, and there's cars everywhere. Yeah, I've never seen a person catch a fish in those places. But I've noticed, if you look out into the forest, you can see these little fresh streams that run out. And she said, Dad, do you know why no one fishes there? I said, I don't, honey. And here's my lesson to you. Because they don't believe that there are better fish in that stream. What do you believe? In the way of the world? Where everybody else climbs to the top of the mountain? Or the way of God, who says to you this morning, this day, on this mountain, I know who you are. I have forgiven you. I am a redeemer of redeemers. I am a leader of leaders, and I want to make a great crossing with you. Will you come with me?